I see. Uh, All right. We are live on Facebook and we have Dr. Anna Fowler and Dr. Blanchard from the University of Maryland here to discuss um, one of Anna's monthly chats. Thank you guys for both joining us and I will let Anna take it away. Yeah. Hi. Okay. So um, Dr. Blanchard, thanks for being willing to do this for us. I know that I have asked you to do this several times already, but you know, it's, um, it's a topic that's not everybody's or anybody's favorite thing to talk about but it's just sort of an unfortunate um, part of a lot of their rare disease space um, and you know in my own personal experience has been you know we have been communicating a lot with your team so um, yeah so let me by way of introduction yeah so everybody who is attending this is a fantastic turnout um, this is Dr. Tom Blanchard. He is, I believe, an associate professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Maryland. Um, but more relevant for us today, what Dr. Blanchard is going to talk about is that he's also the director of the University of Maryland Brain and Tissue Bank, um, which is one of the NIH neurobank hubs, which focuses on pediatric uh, disorders or pediatric patients. And so it really is a really perfect um, collaboration and effort to work with um, Tom and his team. So Dr. Blanchard, I will let you take it away. You um, share your magic. And then at the end, I suspect there's going to be a bunch of questions. Okay. Um, and so I'll either read them out to you from the chat, or you can look at the chat and answer them yourself, but we'll figure it out. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank Great. you. Thanks. Um, yes, I know this is not uh, a great topic, but um, we just want to make families know about their options um, and to help them prepare well ahead of time if they wish um, and to let them know that we're here um, really even if things get urgent, we, we can still be helpful. Uh, so let me share my screen. Can you see that? Perfect. Yep, perfect, looks great. Okay. Uh, so I wanna to speak to you today about our, our brain and tissue bank and why I think it's a little bit different than most tissue banks um, uh, and, and why I think we can, we can potentially be helpful um, for uh, families who are wrestling with any one of a number of, of childhood disorders. Uh, our bank, our bank is, is unique. There are actually a lot of brain banks throughout the country. Um, some of them are private. Some of them are very narrow in scope. So for instance, there's a brain bank specifically for autism spectrum disorder. There, there are brain banks specifically for Alzheimer's disease, brain banks specific for HIV infections. Um, we're part of the NeuroBioBank, as Anna said, and the NeuroBioBank uh, is, is really a, an amazing uh, resource provided by the NIH to the families of people who, who wish to have donation occur, as well as to researchers who are in need of human tissue to do research to, to help address the needs of neurologic research. Uh, there are six banks within this network. We are one of them, right? So, and there's one in Miami, one at Mount Sinai, one at the University of Pittsburgh, one at Harvard, and one at UCLA. And they're all just fantastic banks run by fantastic people, very efficient, very good at what they do. But the NeuroBioBank uh, has, a, has a mission that is quite broad and quite generous, but, but not, might not be ideal for your needs. So the NeuroBioBank was established in 2013 as a resource for investigators to utilize human postmortem brain tissue to understand conditions of the nervous system, including neurologic, neuropsychiatric, and neurodevelopmental diseases, diseases and disorders. And that's, that's actually quite broad. It's supported by at least four different institutes. Importantly, one of those is the NICHD. 
And that's where our, our ability and our mission to reach out to pediatric cases comes from. So, you know, the, the contracts that we receive from the NIH are to provide a mechanism by which families can donate tissue. It's to provide researchers access to human tissue and it's to accelerate research to improve the treatment, cure, and prevention of developmental and neurologic disorders. The, the, the generosity of the NIH here, it's hard to, it's hard to overstate. Um, there's a paucity of human tissue out there for researchers to access. And if you're a researcher studying a neurologic disease and you had to acquire your own tissue, it's almost insurmountable. Um, and there are private sources which, which will sell human tissue in a limited scale, but it's prohibitively expensive. And what the NIHs do through their contracts to the individual banks is provide enough funding so that no family pays anything uh, for any reason to facilitate donation and no researcher pays for any of the samples they request from the neurobiobank other than shipping of the tissue. It's truly a remarkable resource. Uh, and it centralizes things. So there are six six banks within the neurobiobank. Uh, we all have our own websites, as I'll show you in a bit. Um, but if you want to donate uh, to the neurobiobank, or if you want to access tissue from the neurobiobank, there's a centralized portal for both donation, donation and requests. This is the home page I'm showing you here with the website at the bottom. Um, and, and the entire inventory of all six banks are, are, are uploaded onto this portal if you're a researcher. You'll, you could find what you need. And I'll go into that towards the end of the talk. And you can see on the lower right, there's a button for registering if you wanted to donate. The bank supports a wide variety of research. Um, you know, the brain is a big organ. Um, there's a lot of tissue there. And when somebody would request tissue, they're not requesting a large part of that organ. They're often requ requesting milligrams of tissue. Um, and so one donation can serve to help, you know, potentially hundreds of different investigators over the next years to decades. Uh, and, the, and the different types of research that can be done is it's almost inexhaustible, whether that's imaging, genetics, molecular diagnostics, uh, histology, protein chemistry, um, or even, even just examining medical records uh, to look for patterns and to look for clues. Um, it's quite a resource. Some of the elements of the NIH Neurobiobank that are unique amongst biobank biobanks I've listed here, I've, I've already said no charges or fees to donate or receive tissue. That's certainly not going to be the case with a private brain bank. Uh, inventory, it's, it's over 15,000 cases are, are in the combined inventory now. It's probably closer to 20,000, and researchers have ready access to all six banks. Information is also readily available, whether that's medical records, neuropathology reports on every case, toxicology analysis, serology, autopsy reports, and questionnaires. All of this, of course, is redacted. The donor's privacy is protected. Uh, but if you're studying a specific disease, you can access the records from the relevant cases. The interface is searchable um, with an online request portal and service. Uh, I can't speak for the other six banks, but the University of Maryland Brain and Tissue Bank uh, can, can hear from you 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. I'll talk more about that in a bit. So now I want to talk specifically about our bank. This is our homepage. Um, again, just like the NeuroBioBank homepage, we have a quick button for donors and families or for researchers to get further uh, along the process. Now, these six banks that are made, that make up the NeuroBioBank network, they've been in existence for decades, even though the NeuroBioBank itself was only begun in, in 2013. We are, we are all, we've all existed for decades under contracts from the NIH. The University of Maryland was one of the first to be initiated in 1991 with funding exclusively from NI, for NICHD. And that's why our history is really pediatrics focused, um, dedicated to collecting, storing, and distributing tissue for the study of neurologic, movement, developmental, metabolic, behavioral, and psychiatric disorders in infants and children. This mission is broader 
than, than that of the other six banks. The NeuroBioBank has, has a broad mission. So any type of neurologic or behavioral or psychiatric disorder is interesting to the NeuroBioBank. But you're really talking about banks that are collecting from adults, uh, with adult diseases, epilepsy, lots of dementias, Parkinson's disease, uh, Huntington's disease, uh, and others. But really, uh, not to exclude children, but the focus really is on adults. Our bank does have that mission. When we joined the NeuroBioBank in 2014, we had to take on that expanded mission to service adults, but our mission continues to include uh, developmental disorders, disorders that that, uh, that start in childhood, so that even if the donor is an adult when donating, um, we still consider that a childhood disorder if, if it's a disease that manifests itself in childhood. Rare disorders are essential to our mission. There are over 7,000 of them, uh, and people with rare diseases have tremendous unmet needs, including misdiagnosis, it's often a long journey to finally receive a correct diagnosis. And 95% of those rare diseases have no treatment or cure. And that's the whole purpose of the NeuroBioBank is to, is, to, is to progress in our ability to, to help those that don't currently have a cure or a treatment. Our disorders of interest are very broad. This is just a short list of childhood neurologic and developmental disorders that we're interested in. Um, we actually have uh, representatives of over 400 different rare diseases in our bank. This is a, an example of some of the rare diseases that we collected in just a single year. This was a couple of years ago, but you can see things like Alexander disease, galloway mawitz syndrome, ataxia, um, uh, Lennox-Gestalt, Angelman syndrome. Uh, and you'll see on the right the age at which these donations were made. Uh, but we, nevertheless, we consider these childhood and developmental disorders. This is a, and this this changes a little bit every year, but not much. This is a table. This is a table of I think twenty diseases that represent the most commonly requested disorders at the NeuroBioBank. So the NeuroBioBank is sending out as a, as a total sending out thousands and thousands of samples every year. And these are the 20 diseases that are most commonly requested. And I've highlighted in blue those that are childhood disorders. So you can see, even though most of the bank is, is interested in adult diseases, it's the childhood disorders that really still make up about half of researchers' requests. This is from the year 2020, 2021. I, I show this to... to show how much tissue is being requested specifically from the University of Maryland. So these are the six banks um, and these numbers represent how much tissue is requested, not, not supplied, but requested uh, from each bank during a given year. You can see that Maryland's is much higher than the other banks. And there's several reasons for that. Mm. One is that we do have pediatric samples and there are a lot of tremendous number of researchers out there who are interested in studying development and pediatric specific diseases. Uh, and so our distribution of pediatric cases is a third of what we distribute. This is, this is since joining the NeuroBioBank in 2014. So one of the reasons we just received more requests is because we have the pediatric cases, we have the rare disease cases that researchers are interested in. Now this is a this is these are graphs that show our recoveries. Um, over on the right are our raw numbers, so you can see um, the number of cases of pediatric donors is in blue. I'm sorry, on the, over on the left, uh, and and over time, that number has started to decrease a little bit. You can see after joining the NeuroBioBank in 2014, our number of adult recoveries started to climb and it's, it's actually climbed quite significantly now. What is concerning to us is the graph on the right, where you can see as a percentage of our total recoveries, our pediatric recoveries are actually dropping, such as they're only about 10% of what we recover now. We attribute that to branding. So we used to be known as the NICHD uh, bank uh, for you know, childhood and developmental disorders. So if you were searching online, you would find us pretty quickly if you were in need of donation, 
looking where to go, how to do this. Uh, when we rebranded, when we joined the Neurobiobank, all that, all those words about development and childhood have been taken out. So people don't find us as easily. Um, and so we hope to rebrand soon uh, in, in the hopes that that'll make it easier for people to find us. Another reason we get a lot of requests is because we really are a brain and tissue bank. The other banks are, I wouldn't say exclusively brain, but but close to it. Uh, they might collect spine when required. They might re collect a little muscle tissue. Um, but really, we're the only bank that that make it routine practice to collect non-brain tissue. And that's important for diseases that have manifestations outside of the brain. Um, so if a disease has uh, it, it impacts the liver or the digestive tract uh, or the kidneys, um, then, then when we cover from that case, we're gonna make an effort to collect the relevant tissues for that disorder. Um, and researchers are interested in those. This date is a bit old. Uh, it ends in 2018, but it's just to illustrate that non-brain tissue can make up about 20% of what we send out every year. And we're sending out a total of anywhere between 3,000 and 4,000 samples per year. Um, and so you can see on the right, the, the variety of different tissues that we might collect. Uh, I, I don't mean to give the impression that on every donor we're collecting all of these tissues. And in fact, on most donors, we are only collecting the brain and some blood and, sp and spinal fluid and some muscle. Um, but on many, many cases, we're able to collect other relevant tissues. Cases come to us from a number of different venues. Uh, the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner here in Maryland uh, is, is a good source of tissues for us over on the lower left. We have contracts with organizations whose job it is to facilitate uh, tissue research. Um, we work at the American SIDS Institute uh, as a source of kids who die unexpectedly uh, when they're less than four years old uh, through our association with some medical examiners throughout the country. Organ procurement organizations help direct tissues our way, our way but mostly um, up at 12 o'clock and over at two o'clock either through direct registry and referral with the University of Maryland Brain and Tissue Bank or indirectly by people trying to register through the Neurobiobank. This is where the bulk of our, our intake is coming from. We, it's important for everybody to know that we collect cases from across the country. Um, th this is a, this is, this is to show the number of cases we've, re we've recovered from each state since joining the Neurobiobank. If we went back to our origin in 1991, you would see that we have recovered cases from, from every, every state in the union. Um, obviously those that are closer to us, like Virginia and Pennsylvania uh, are gonna have a higher number, but, but we can reach out to the whole country. Um, when we get a call, um, we may have people in the area where the donor is, is located, whom we've worked with before to perform that recovery. Uh, but even if we don't, we can start cold calling. We can call clinics and hospitals in the area to talk to their pathologists and ask if they know anybody who does this uh, on their own as an independent contractor. And most of the time, the great majority of the time, we can track down someone who's willing to travel to get to that case, who has the ability to perform the recovery and preserve the tissue and, and ship it to us. However, there are occasions when we cannot. There are occasions when, when a case may be too remote uh, or we just can't come to a reasonable contract with a local tissue recovery agent to make that recovery. So that is a possibility when, you, when you're uh, making an arrangement with us, that there is the possibility that we can't pull it off. But in the great majority of cases, we can do it. Uh, and, and this just shows you how many are pre-registered with our bank specifically, not the Norbio Bank, with the University of Maryland Brain and Tissue Bank. So mm -hmm. every state in the union has people that have contacted us, they've registered with us, which means we have their consent on file, they've signed all the proper paperwork, and when the time is right, 
they can just contact us and we'll put things in motion to make the recovery happen. Okay, so donating to the brain and tissue bank. Um, you should know that tissue and organ donation is accepted by most major religious organizations. Um, a traditional funeral service may be planned post tissue donation. Um, it does not interfere with having an open casket if that's your wish. Anyone regardless of age is invited to donate, at least with Maryland. Um, and registration to donate does not obligate someone to donate, right? So uh, it by no means uh, do you have to follow through with this. But if you, if you register in advance, at least it'll make things go quite a bit easier if you choose to, in the event of death, have tissue donated to the brain bank. As I said before, there's no cost to the donor or the donor's next of kin. The brain bank will make all arrangements for tissue recovery. And that oftentimes includes us arranging for transport of the donor's body. So for instance, we can, um, if, if the body is not, already, is not already at a funeral home, we can, we can cover the cost of getting into the funeral home if that funeral home will allow us to do the recovery there. If the body's at a funeral home that will not allow it, we will find a place that will allow the recovery to occur, and then we will pay for transport to that recovery location and then back to the funeral home of the next of kin's choice. As I said before, recovery can include the brain as well as systemic tissues. And although pre-registration is best, donation can be arranged if the bank is contacted in a timely fashion, if death is imminent or if death has already occurred. But in those cases, um, we're really working against the clock. All right. You should know that there are exclusion criteria uh, that we have to keep in mind when deciding whether or not we are able to take a case. Uh, you know by now that Maryland does not have an age range, um, but we do preferably like to have infectious disease testing. Um, we like to know about a history of possible exposure to HIV or hepatitis. Um, we need to know if there's a history of cancer and if that cancer has metastasized to the brain. This is not necessarily a deal breaker, but it's something we need to know about. A history of chemo radiation. Uh, this slide's a little bit outdated. We used to dis we used to exclude uh, chemo or radiation. We do not anymore, but we need to know how how recently it's occurred. Sepsis uh, can be an exclusion criteria. Ventilation. This is really the most complicated one, and, and quite frankly, it's the most heartbreaking. Uh, time on a ventilator uh, can be detrimental to certain organs, including the lungs and the brain. Extended time on the ventilator makes it such that the brain is, is unlikely to be useful by researchers because certain types of molecular changes have occurred. There are banks that will not allow any ventilator time at all. There are banks that will take ventilation up to 24 hours. There are brains that differentiate between being completely dependent on a ventilator and being assisted by a ventilator. We don't have a hard and fast rule at Maryland. We play this on a case by case basis, but you should know uh, that it can be an exclusion criteria and the longer on a ventilator, the less likely we are going to be able to recover that case. Um, we are flexible. We are much more flexible with pediatric cases in general and rare disease cases specifically when it comes to excluding these cases. One of the things we're most flexible about with these rare disease cases is the post-mortem interval. And so basically, it's, it's beneficial to, to get that brain tissue preserved within 24 hours of death. Uh, certainly beneficial to get that brain cold. Um, researchers, you know, there's nothing magic about 24 hours, but researchers seem to draw a line in the sand. When they request tissue, they like it to be 24 hours uh, uh, post-mortem interval time. Um, but with rare, with rare tissue, rare cases, we do make an exception and we will take cases after 36 hours, maybe out to 48 hours. So, so please keep that in mind when you're making these choices 
um, that we will be flexible with this to a point uh, because these cases are so important and the family's already been through so much. Okay, so there are two routes where you could register to donate with the University of Maryland Brain and Tissue Bank. One is through the NeuroBioBank website, and I showed you an image of their homepage. There's a big button on there for donate. You press it, you'll, you'll, you'll be brought along to what to do next. Same with the, if you want to register directly with the University of Maryland Brain and Tissue Bank. You go to our website, you go to the donor button, and you'll be walked through the process. So let's talk about the NeuroBioBank option first. This is, uh, this is not the home page, but if you go to the home page and you push the donor button, you will be brought to this page. And the purpose of this page is to introduce you to the Brain Donor Project. The NeuroBioBank is a very well-run NIH initiative, um, but the NeuroBioBank staff do not have anything to do with brain registration. The Brain Donor Project was started as a foundation, a nonprofit foundation for the sole purpose of helping people to register for brain donation with the NIH NeuroBioBank. And so what they've done here is they provided a way to reroute you directly to the Brain Donor Project. So if you hit the donor button at the NeuroBioBank website, you'll come to this page. You can then click the button, the lower button down here in purple uh, to visit the Brain Donor Project. The folks at the Brain Donor Project are gonna take some preliminary information. Um, they're gonna figure out right up front whether, whether you're a likely candidate for donation. And if you are, you will be routed to the appropriate bank. All right. um, you can see this map on the right of the United States. Each of the six banks is represented by a, a, a gold star. Uh, but in fact, not all the banks take cases like Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh works exclusively with their medical examiner's office. So cases are not going to be rerouted to the Pittsburgh. Um, but uh, there are four of the six banks that kind of have catchment areas within the country and the Brain Donor Project will direct the donor to the right bank based on where they live in the country. And the states in yellow represent the states that are in Maryland's catchment area with regards to the Brain Donor Project. And that's why if you would look back at that map I showed you earlier, we have an exceptionally high number of cases donated from these states, all the Great Lakes and the Mid-Atlantic states because we're getting referrals to the Brain Donor Project. However, the Brain Donor Project will route pediatric and rare disease cases to the UMBTB regardless of where the donor resides. Um, and, I, and I don't mean to suggest that one of those other banks won't take your case. They may or they may not. Certainly Miami uh, is, is more open than others. Um, but, but you just don't know. Uh, it's not really core to their mission. If you're not being rerouted to Maryland, you can always ask the folks at the Brain Donor Project to route you to Maryland. Uh, but it's likely they're, they're already going to know to do that. Okay, so how do you register with the University of Maryland directly? This is our homepage, um, big red button for registration. You hit that button uh, and it'll, it'll walk you to the next step. Um, you can go this route or you can call us directly with our phone number, which is down there at the bottom of the page. As I mentioned at the beginning, we are open all the time. Uh, that doesn't mean we're manning the phones all the time. But after hours or on weekends, if you call, you will get an answering service and that answering service will take your information and, that ad, and then that answering service will contact whichever one of our project coordinators is on call. And then that project coordinator will reach back out to you uh, when they get the message. Now, uh, if this is a routine registration case um, and it's after hours, they might tell you uh, there's no hurry uh, we'll call you back in the morning. Or if it's a Saturday night, they might say, we'll get back to you on Monday. But if this is a case where death is imminent or death has already occurred, no matter what time of the day or what day of the week, um, we're going to jump into action. We're going to get the consenting done if we can. Uh, and we're going to, and if we can get it on time, we're going to try to put our ducks in a row to make a recovery happen. Um, the registration requires the next of kin 
to complete a consent form, uh, a HIPAA document for release of medical records, to complete a questionnaire, uh, and then get that material back to us. This has been doing, we've been doing this in a very antiquated way. Uh, a lot of it's still through snail mail or the fax machine. And that's because we have some uh, uh, limitations at our university for what we, we are able to receive via email. Uh, so this can make things go a little slower. Um, with Anna's help, uh, we have learned about REDCap, uh, which will allow us to put all these documents online, accessible through our website, uh, and everything can be done very quickly uh, uh, online. There will be no passing of paper. Those documents are ready to go. They haven't been. They haven't received final approval, but we've we've digitized everything we need to digitize, and we hope to make this uh, online live within a few weeks. So that would that would make things much less stressful for the families and make things happen much more quicker. Uh, okay, this is how brain recovery workflow works. If you look up in the upper left, the donor goes through the consenting process with project coordinators. When we are alerted, the project coordinators then work with what's down in the lower left uh, to, to make the autopsy happen. The tissue gets sent to our facility and tissue coordinators will then process it, store it for distribution. They will perform quality control. They will send samples to neuropathologists um, and then all that data ultimately gets uploaded into a centralized database after being redacted and made available through the NeuroBioBank. Um, I should say before I forget that every, every donor receives a complete neuropathology analysis on the brain, and that neuropathology report is made available to the next of kin. Uh, okay. I've already said registration does not obligate tissue donation. It can be done years in advance or immediately after passing. Uh, but the donor's family can, can really make this easier on us as a bank by assisting, by requesting medical records for Maryland, either before death has occurred or shortly after. Uh, when we have to request those records, even after you've signed the HIPAA release form, uh, it can take, it may take us days or weeks, it may take us months to years to acquire medical records. Uh, and those are extremely important for the way we analyze each case uh, and how we and how what we're able to say about those cases when we post them on the NeuroBioBank website. So any help that you can provide in acquiring medical records uh, would greatly facilitate this process. Um, I wanna reassure you that we have a state-of-the-art facility if you're in the brain banking industry, you know of nightmare scenarios where people have a freezer that fails uh, and they weren't alerted in time and that tissue gets lost and it's a tremendous waste. Um, we have at least 50 freezers now. In addition to our fixed tissue facility, every freezer has uh, emergency power backup in case power fails in the building. Uh, we have a liquid CO2 backup, which if the temperature comes up to a certain point, the liquid CO2 gets dumped into the freezer and provides us about four or five additional hours before we need to act. And we have an alarm system. So every single freezer is on an, a wireless alarm system where we can monitor its temperature 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And we are alerted remotely if a freezer starts to fail. So I want you to feel assured that if you donate tissue, it will be cared for appropriately. For requesting tissues from the NBB, in case there are any researchers uh, watching, or if any of the families are working with researchers, this is the process. You go to the NeuroBioBank website and it walks you through, You, as a researcher, you would need to create an account, you would need to register with the system, you would have to provide a PDF of your, your curriculum vitae, and you would have to fill out an MTA uh, agreement, which is pretty boilerplate, um, which, which makes it possible to transfer tissue from one institute to another. As a researcher, you're then able to go onto the inventory site and you can be as selective as you want. I've used uh, San Filippo mucopolycidosis as a representative disease. 
you can see here it's just a, a sample selection where they've searched for these cases from Maryland, and you can see they get a list of what's in the inventory. But this selection can be remarkably granular. If you look over on the left, you can see the number of, of requirements a researcher can select for. They can be highly selective in choosing which cases might be interested to them. Um, so it's a fantastic resource uh, for the researchers. Once they identify the cases of interest, they then fill out an application and submit it to the NeuroBioBank where it will be reviewed for scientific integrity. Um, and if approved, the, the, unit, the, the, the banks will fill the order. Okay. I will close out with a quote that my predecessor, Ron Zilke, who started this bank would always post in his presentations. And that's that some diseases are uniquely human and ultimately require the study of human tissue. And the diseases we're talking about here today certainly qualify. Even with animal models, there are certain questions, certain information that just cannot be acquired through those routes. Uh, the use of human tissue uh, for, for neurologic research is of paramount importance. I thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Awesome, that was great. Thank you, Dr. Blanchard, that was fantastic. That was exactly what what I think we everybody Good. wanted to hear. Um, so I cheated a little bit and I wrote about five to six questions I had. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't put them in the chat yet because I didn't want to cut the line if there were people who were attending and listening, if they had questions, if you want to write them and put them in the chat. Um, and, uh, I don't see I, any... We did get one uh, question online. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Oh. Blanchard, obviously our community is worldwide. And so do you have connections with other brain banks in other countries or anything like that? Is there a kind of any kind of global connections? So we can certainly distribute and we do distribute tissue worldwide um, every week. Um, collection is a different matter. Um, we can't arrange for recoveries. I think we, we've done a good number in Canada, but none recently. Mm -hmm. um, that's something I think really would benefit us to have more advanced notice. But other than that, um, really, I think uh, you, you probably have to find a local source. Um, and we're happy to work with that local source. We're happy to receive tissue from that third party. Um, I know more and more countries are trying to start brain banks, um, but I'm not that familiar with, with the international networks at this point. But no, we can't, we cannot arrange for recoveries overseas. Thank you. Yeah, doing international tissue donation or even like um, living biological sample donation, it seems to be like, I, it's not a thing. I don't understand why, I mean, I understand why it exists, yeah. but it well, seems I like a hurdle different... that there's enough demand within the rare disease community. That's something that some brilliant person needs to focus a lot of their efforts towards overcoming. Cause we have, okay. you know, this happens just as much outside the US as it sure. does here too. Um, uh, it's something I can pursue with the NIH NeuroBioBank staff. You know, there are different regulations from one country to another. Shipping, especially with frozen tissue, is can be prohibitively expensive, right? You're talking about a large box with dry ice, to, a large, long time of trans. So I think there's some practical issues and possibly some regulatory issues, but I can start that conversation. Yeah. Um, Okay, were there any other questions in the chat? Otherwise, I'm going to rattle off a couple. Go okay. ahead, Anna. Um, when, when people submit a request, so a, a researcher requests a, a sample from a, the NIH NeuroBank, um, is there, do they have to submit, like, this is what I'm going to do with it, or a scientific justification at all? So someone theoretically reviews it to make sure, yeah, this seems like a good idea. This is a good use of this finite material. Right. Is yes. that? Okay. The short answer is yes, absolutely. So it's not like writing a grant, so to speak, but you're, 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 
what you plan to do that with the tissue has to be scientifically justified. The numbers that you're requesting have to be statistically justified. Um, especially as you as you alluded, especially for these cases, the the neurobiobank staff has a subcommittee of which I'm a part um, specifically to review. Let me start over. Every request goes through an algorithm. And that algorithm is to determine uh, based on the number of tissues requested, the number of sites in the brain requested, and the rarity of the tissue, right? Mm -hmm. um, it'll get a certain number. And if it goes above a certain number, there's a committee that reviews, that gives that proposal a heightened review to make sure that they're not gonna, that the tissue is gonna be used appropriately and not wasted. Um, if you order too few, sometimes if you order too few samples, it can be a waste because you're not gonna reach, when you get your results, you won't reach statistical significance because your sample size wasn't high enough. And obviously if you, we don't want people requesting a hundred different cases if 15 will do. Um, so we ask, we do ask for a pretty rigorous scientific justification uh, for why they're doing the experiment and for why they need the numbers that they need. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, can you give us, you gave us one slide, but um, can you give us an example just off the top of your head of what people are using or requesting tissues for? Like um, what type of science, what type of project? Like um, we've had people ask us, well, what, what are people gonna do with it? We do yeah. all this work to collect it and what's it useful for? And sure. a secondary question to that is, do, are there cases where you can be flexible about like how it's collected or how it's processed? Um, I, I think I know from what you said, you know, sort of one hemisphere is processed one way, another hemisphere is processed another way, but let's just imagine some researcher needs it done a certain way. Is there like, are there exceptions like that? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, so you're correct. And this is a general brain bank convention that the uh, right hemisphere is fixed in formalin, the left hemisphere is frozen. I mean, it's sectioned, it's, it's sectioned and then it's preserved um, because that those preps facilitate different types of research. And so if you're doing microscopic research where you're just looking to see if a specific protein is at a specific location in the brain, you're gonna to wanna to use fixed tissue that's where the resolution is going to be, right? But probably 70% of the requests that we get are for frozen tissue. Mm -hmm. um, because with frozen tissue, you can still do the microscopy, but you can also try to isolate proteins and it won't be denatured. You can isolate nucleic acids and do genetics, right? You can, you can do expression analysis. You can isolate single cells and see where, which cells in which part of the brain are expressing a certain protein. Um, another thing people will ask for is instead of just a small sample, they might ask if we have any actual large sections of the brain that haven't been cut up that much because they're, they want to do imaging, uh, either by CT or MRI, and they really want to characterize mm -hmm. that brain and that disease and compare it to, to a different type of donor. So a lot of imaging, a lot of protein isolation, a lot of protein localization, a lot of gene expression. You know, what, what's different? What genes are being expressed differently in this case than in a person who doesn't have a neurologic disorder or a person who has a neurologic disorder, but kind of a completely different type of disorder, right? So it's, it's a tremendous amount of variability. Um. Okay, I have uh, okay, I have another relatively easy question, then a couple of hard questions, which I feel like, yeah. Um, okay, so uh, you mentioned you guys try and pull some sort of clinical information for each donor, so that, mm. which is why you have the HIPAA form and get medical records sent. So what can you give us specific information on what types of information you're looking for from the medical records? So this is, this is just how the neurobiobank is dictated. They want us to list cases, right? If, if someone, I'm going to use Alzheimer's disease as an example, all right? If you have a parent who's 
terminal, they've, they've had dementia and, and everybody's saying it's Alzheimer's disease. And even the doctor says it's Alzheimer's disease and you fill in the questionnaire and you say it's Alzheimer's disease, that's how we have to list it. That's how it's gonna go on the NeuroBioBank database, even if it's wrong. <laughs> All right? okay. that, those are our orders. Now, we have neuropathologists who need to look at the medical records in total, whatever we can get, the medications that were being taken, the behavioral aspect of the history, and they will say, based on that information, whether it really probably is Alzheimer's disease, right? So it'll be listed as Alzheimer's disease, and then it'll be graded one, two, or three. A one is confirmed. Yes, this is Alzheimer's disease. A two is investigator impression. We can't be 100% sure, but most likely this is strongly indicative of Alzheimer's disease. And if it's a number three, it's insufficient information. There's just... We have a medical history, but there's no reason to suggest that that's Alzheimer's disease. Dementia, yes. Alzheimer's disease, no. In the grand scheme of things with dementia, you really can't tell what it is until you do a neuropath report, right? And so in this case, it might be frontotemporal dementia. The researcher will see that. If they call up that case, they'll see in the clinical brain diagnosis column, it'll say Alzheimer's disease, investigator impression. Then the, right next to it, it'll say neuropathology, frontotemporal dementia. And so the, the researcher will know, oh, I'm, it's frontotemporal dementia. And that's not what I'm interested in. And so they won't take that case. So with dementias, that's kind of more important. But that's the standard for, for every case. We are stuck with the diagnosis we are given. And that's how it will be listed online. But we want the medical records to, 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 to be sure that that's what the disease is. If there's genetic information, if there's been a genetic test for the whatever the disease is, we want to make that available. We want to tell researchers, look, this has been confirmed genetically, and and by the way, this is this is the test result. Um, and there are researchers who just they want to know the history of, of the course of the disease. Um, for whatever reason, they might want to know what the treatments were, um, what the symptoms were over time. Um, what, what were the manifestations of disease other than the normal manifestations? So um, they help us evaluate the case and they can help researchers who, are, who want to go further than just doing bench, yeah. bench research. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay, so I have a little bit of a harder question, which is, you know, uh, when, when families reach out to us or, you know, Ashley or any of the other patient advocacy groups that we all work with. Um, you know, we don't, we don't want to have them, give them the impression that their kid is eligible to do this sort of, so, you know, very significant contribution to scientific research if they're not eligible. So we like, in which case, let's say the kid is on the ventilator because this happens a lot. Yeah. How can we, and, in the handful of cases that we've worked together already, I, I feel like the patient advocacy group it, it sort of plays the liaison anyway, right? Which is, um, I think will always be the case because we're trying to alleviate the burden on the caregivers. Um, so are there, is there some rubric that we can use that's like, or should we just, we, we call you and say, this is the case. This is what the kid has. This is the situation. Yeah. Can you give us a rough estimate of whether you'll accept this or not? Right. And then we'll go, okay, we won't bug the, the, the parents to do this. So it is always a good idea to have a conversation with us first. Um, okay. We're mm -hmm. happy to have that conversation with the family or, or a third party liaison. All right. And I, and I know like, this is tough, right? Um, Two hours is really short. That is short. And, and, and to be, to be frank, we set that limit to keep us from getting flooded by other types of cases. Um, if we open the door to every Alzheimer's case that wanted to donate, yeah, we would all be swamped. Um, yeah. um, so two hours is low. Um, if, if someone came to us and it was, day 
maybe two days, we would talk. Yeah. Okay. If if we're talking about seven days, it's it's really yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Having said that, having said that though, um, if the disease had non-brain sequelae, um, there might still be value in collecting those tissues. Yeah. Um, so you know, we'll do whatever we can. Uh, yeah. Service people's needs. Perfect. Um, so my my last question is that is the perfect segue for that. So you listed basically every other body part in the human being as other potential tissues that you guys could collect. But um, what is the best process that you would like for you know people like Ashley or other patient advocacy group leaders or someone like myself, some advocate to say, you know, as we're serving as the liaison. How do we tell you our wish list, knowing full well that like you can, you try the best that you can. What's the best way to communicate that to people? So on a case by case basis. Yeah, what we try to do is we have a list of disorders, and and so our so our project coordinators know when they're setting up the contract with the recovery technician. They can look at this list of disorders and they can know what, what we should be trying to ask to be recovered. And so for every disease, um, the advocacy group can just tell us um, after speaking with researchers or physicians, look, whether that's a, just one other tissue or seven, right? Okay. These are tissues that may be of interest to researchers in the future, and then we'll do our best to get those. So okay. we, we so wouldn't be handling it on... we would. Case by case basis, based on disease by disease, but not from individual to individual, right? So, got it. If, okay. Right. So you're saying if if like all of the groups that are part of Combined Brain, so like people like Ashley, she can meet with her researchers, say what's the most meaningful, what's the most valuable tissue that that you could use for your own research. They come up with a consensus of a, a list, and then you sort of just keep that for yep. your reference and say, okay, we have a we have a kid with this disorder, parents would like to donate. You look at your list and say they'd also like this, this, and this. Right. Is that an email to to, to you, to someone else? Like um, I'm, trying, I'm being very careful could, not to inundate you with uh, <laughs> things. No, no, uh, it, it can be to me. Uh, it can be to me. And I'm, I'm just gonna okay. kick it over to Grace or Mackenzie and work with them, okay. but okay. it should come to me uh, because those positions wrote, you know, rotate, yeah. people leave, people come. Uh, keep in mind that the brain is a whole organ recovery, but if we're recovering like liver or spleen or whatever, we're, we're taking a sample. We're not taking Yeah, right. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, so the best, the timing of that is like we go back and we say, okay, everybody, you talk amongst your researchers and figure out what the other types of tissues and we make it really clear, no promises, but we make every effort to do okay. Right. Okay. Right. Um, this is fantastic. Oh my gosh. And I am excited <laughs> for that red cat form to be up. I think that's gonna yes. make a huge difference in your your percent recovery cases and also for, for families. So. For yeah. for moms and dads who have to figure out who in the world still has a fax machine. <laughs> yes, yes. I, I hope know. that's not yeah. one behind you, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. That's okay. my printer. Um, <laughs> okay. No, we, okay. we, we agree. Uh, and I really thank you for bringing that to our attention. Yeah. Um, we could have no, done this years totally, ago. Yeah. Totally great. Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Blanchard for your time. I'm really grateful. I think, um, you will have lots of probably emails or outreach. Um, and I have a couple things to follow up on too, and getting you lists for disorders and do okay. it in a somewhat cohesive fashion. Great. But this is great. I think a lot of people, when they're ready, they'll listen to this recording. Yeah. Super. Happy to okay. Help. Well, thank you, everybody else in the internet web land. <laughs> um, everybody have a good rest of your day. All right. Bye, everyone. Thank bye you, bye. Dr. Blanchard. Bye.